How many feel like anxiety when you hear climate change? Okay, yes, a good majority in here. How many feel, well, you know, climate change, is, it's okay. I'm gonna buy a piece of land, grow some wine. <laughs> Nobody dares to say that, okay? I just wanted to check, I just wanted to check. This is my agenda. We have a doomsday coming up, no doubt. I mean, you heard about this a lot. You read about it all the time. And of course, we can get stuck in that. You know, we love that to a certain extent as humans. You know, oh, it's dark, it's gloomy, especially in November, you know. But actually, we are heading towards spring. So we also know that, yes, there is hope. Something is going to happen in the future. There, this is also an agenda of opportunities. If we are going to realize this agenda of opportunities, we will need a lot of leadership. And this leadership will come from the private sector, very much. So that's why I'm here, to talk to you about this. Send you that signal that you are so important. We cannot expect anyone else to do the job that we all have to do. The most common thing, as you know, when you work in an organization, is the statement, someone should. Have you heard about that? Yes. Someone should do something. Well, we passed that. We all have to do something about the future. What I find exciting to be, let's see now, here, leadership in times of rapid transformation. You know, I, I don't need to talk about this, because you are a company, you are in a sector where trans transformation is your daily job. Has things changed over the past five years? Is it very different today than five years ago in your business? Will it be very different from five, you know, five years from now? Okay. I work a lot with the steel industry and you know, forest industry and so on. And rapid transformation in the steel industry is about 40 to 50 years. <laughs> That's rapid transformation. So it's really exciting to be at a place where transformation is, yeah, 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 we, we know that. We, you know, we just move on. Tell us what it is we need to do. You know this much more than I do, so I will not get stuck in your business. I go back to what I know, climate. Here you go. These are the pictures we see. These pictures are true, by the way. We cannot be naive. Climate change is here. Climate change is changing our planet. Climate change has a lot of impact on societies, on the environment. We see these pictures all the time. And they make us nervous, no doubt. Climate change tends to be far away. And this is actually one of the challenges when, when we you know, talk about getting people's commitment to do something. The fact that we see polar bears, but yeah, the polar bears, that, you know, only Americans think that we have polar bears in Stockholm, but polar bears are you know, far away. Or we see poor people being hurt by climate change. It's, it's distant. This summer, we were reminded here in the Nordic countries, not least in Sweden, that climate change can also have profound impact on our societies, on our economy. This was extreme weather. I cannot tell you if the next summer will be like this. I know that some Swedes, at least, would like to hear that. Hmm. But I cannot tell you. It can be a cold summer. But we were reminded that the impacts of climate change can actually be profound on society, even threaten potentially our food security. Forest industry, you know, heavy economic impacts. Interesting enough, the debate has generally been that, well, you know, for the forest sector, climate change in Sweden is probably, you know, it's positive. It will grow more, you know, trees will grow longer, uh, longer uh, time periods and so on. But this reminded us again that it's not so simple because trees, not, they don't just need warm weather, they also need water. So you can have drought at the same time. So the impact of climate change is here and we will feel it also in Sweden. Are we heading in the right direction? If you're an economist, you like these kind of curves because they're going up. The CO2 emissions actually still, we have you know, real, <laughs> a serious problem with the increase. Uh, this is from the 1990s, and you can see what the percentage increase has been in different time periods. The challenge was that over a few years, from 2014, we actually could see that CO2 emissions leveled out. We, we did interpret this partly as the success of the beginning of the transformation. The fact that renewables started to be uh, more uh, in place, that we 
could see uh, changes in consumption patterns, etc. There were a number of things that we could see working in the right direction. Unfortunately, in 2017 and 2018, the numbers go up again. So emissions now are increasing at a rate these last couple of years around two and a half to three percent again. So we are going, we are moving in the wrong direction. This is not enough. This is not yet a transformative agenda. We are still stuck in the old fossil-based economy. Risks then, isn't it beautiful, by the way? Clear, isn't it clear? This is going to be your workshop tomorrow. No, the World Economic Forum, um, they make a global risk report every year. Okay, have you read it? Yes, you have, some others have. So this is a think tank of the global corporate sector to a certain extent, trying to analyze the world. I'm always fascinated about how many risks companies see. Uh, risks for their business, risks for society. The trend over the past couple of years has been that these green dots, they are related to environment and climate, they have moved up the scale, both in terms of likelihood and in terms of impact. So if you analyze global changes and the risks they uh, represent, climate change has headed up to the top here, and extreme weather events is actually up in this corner. So compared to many other things that we feel should pose serious risk for business, such as, for instance, um, uh, insta political instability, uh, failure of critical infrastructure, etc., these are much lower in comparison to climate risks today, evaluated by, evaluated by global uh, leaders. And to make things even worse, we also have other changes. Climate change is not acting in isolation from other uh, environmental uh, issues. This is an example. About 40% of agricultural land today in the world, in particular in the tropics, is degraded. So the basis for our food security is actually seriously degraded. And this is the situation we have, and this in combination then with also other environmental pressures. How many have heard about Bolzano? Yes, so you know that the ambition now is to speed up deforestation of the Amazon forest. We may think that this is, of course, extremely uh, irresponsible, but at the same time, we are part of this system. It's for, produ pro uh, for production of soybeans, of meat, etc., that is actually sold all over the world. So it's part of the global economy, the challenge that we have in other parts of the world as well. We are all connected. So the story, the negative story, the doomsday story, is not difficult to tell. And it's a true story. These are trends that we can see. It's not trends that we just perceive, they are measurable. And the scale is staggering. If you look at what they project in Brazil in terms of exploration of the Amazon rainforest in the next couple of years, they are talking about uh, cutting down a surface equal to France. So it's quite dramatic. We need to understand the drivers also behind these um, changes, because these drivers, in many cases very transformative, are also this, at the same time our hope. If we understand how the planet or societies, how economies are shifting, that's where we also have, where we also have the opportunities to intervene. Anyone born 1950 in here? I don't think we, you know, we passed that. No one is born in the 1940s any longer. Okay. So 1950 is 69 years ago. Um, we had, if we looked at demographic, we had seven megacities in the world, cities with more than five million people. This was the planet back then. So New York, uh, we had uh, Buenos Aires, we had London, we had Paris, we had the Ruhr, which was considered as an urban conglomerate. We had Moscow, we had Shanghai, we had Tokyo. Quite, you know, easy even for uh, someone born in the 1960s to pick these uh, cities, you know. That was the world in 1950 in terms of mega cities. So in 65 years to 2015, how did things change? You work in a business of transformative change. 
you know that things can move very fast. The population, of course, we know it's growing, but how does it work with cities? This is, these are cities in 2015. So in 65 years, it's a completely different planet. So we have to project also then for the future. What does this mean? How much are cities growing today? One million people per week is the urbanization rate today. So it means that we have to build, in principle, one Stockholm every week in the world. And of course, we are building these very sustainably. Perfect transport systems. I know that, at least here in Stockholm, we, you know, we like to complain about our transport system, but challenges elsewhere are you know, at a certain level uh, of magnitude higher, I would argue. So we, had we have enormous challenges in this, urban in this urbanization. And if you take a country like uh, India, for instance, uh, the urbanization rate you are talking about there, according to their own st statistics, being at the same rate as we've seen in China, India will have 400 million more people living in cities by 2050. Uh, if you translate that to infrastructure uh, development, it means that India will build one and a half time of the city infrastructure that the entire United States has today in 35 years. So you have to you know, think about New York, Chicago, Houston, Dallas, Los Angeles, Washington, all these cities, times one and a half in 35 years. So these are huge challenges that we are facing when still the economy builds on these kind of structures. Is this a perfectly connected transport infrastructure? Do you think that digitalization could actually do something here? Potentially. Are there potentials actually in the fact that we are facing these challenges and other environmental challenges in our cities? This is a, the, you know, a standard city air to breathe in many Asian cities today, not least in, in India once, you know, once again. About five to seven million people die every year from air pollution. About two and a half to three million women and children die due to indoor air pollution. So we can make you know, a very long story about this. So how about the leadership now? Do you feel happier now? Do you feel, yes, we are moving in the right direction? Well, you know, politicians also felt somewhat tired uh, in 2009 when they all met in Copenhagen. This is a breaking point. If you look at international negotiations and trying to understand what actually happened in a few years' time, why you can actually argue that we are moving at least from one agenda to another. You know, why we see we have a shift in international policies right now. Well, 2009 was a breaking point. We had a major global meeting in Copenhagen, a climate meeting that was going to replace the agreement we had, the so-called Kyoto Protocol. This meeting failed completely, which was wonderful. It was absolutely great that it failed. I don't know how it is in organization, but you know, sometimes when you need a shift, when you need to move from one stage to another, when you need to start to set daring goals, potentially, you need to maybe fail first in order to see other opportunities. For instance, radical collaboration, that you have to find other ways forward. And radical collaboration, this was actually all about it in this meeting. What happened here? Well, here are the Western leaders. Only one of them remains still. That's democracy. Um, they are meeting over there. In another room met China, India, Russia and South Africa. They didn't talk to each other. Everybody was looking at this man who should come and save everything, Obama, who, and he was, of course, fully aware of the fact that he couldn't bring home an agreement because he would never be accepted in the US. The rhetorics in Copenhagen, the rhetorics, the way we were talking about the climate issue, was the same way that I have been talking about it now for about 12 to 30 minutes. It is a negative agenda. We talked about the need to have a transformation, but then we added, and we all need to share the burden of the transformation. That was exactly the words that were used. I don't know if Telia uses this language, 
Dear friends, dear colleagues, we will now share the burden of our operations. I hope you feel inspired. <laughs> but this, exact, this was exactly the, the conversation. We need to share the burden. And the corporate sector wasn't really there. It was really still only national political actors, very strong focus on national political actors. They were there. They were the ones that should take responsibility. We were expecting them to make decisions. And to make things even worse, we had the financial crisis at the same time. So, you know, everybody was very worried about anything that could potentially threaten uh, a recovery of the economy. And to make things even worse, these guys, the NGOs, the non-governmental organizations who argue that there is no planet B over here, they also put up an ice statue of a polar bear outside the conference center. And it was supposed to melt. But it was very cold <laughs> in Copenhagen in December 2009. It didn't melt. Be careful about, you know, symbolic politics and so on. So, in many ways, you know, everything failed here. We got a Copenhagen Accord, and to be honest, Copenhagen Accord is not that bad. It's the first time we talk about the one and a half and two degrees and the Green Climate Fund and many other things to save the face of the negotiators. But things didn't really work out. What happened then? Then come, you know, then comes the trigger. Transformative change. Things started to happen symbolically this solar power plant. So after 2009, we started to see a change in the world in so many different ways. And all of them came together and actually became the Paris Agreement. So this was actually six years later. And I know I asked you before, you know, did things look very different five years ago? Five years for you is a long time huh? when you plan and so on. When it comes to international diplomacy and climate negotiations, five years is like, you know, the next second. That's the transformative change, that you can move from a situation where you have complete chaos and collapse, more or less, of the multilateral system to actually get a strong climate agreement that we got in Paris. This is an amazing agreement. Don't listen to all these guys saying, well, it's not enough, and if we add everything here, it will still be 3.2, whatever. Again, these are, you know, People who cannot see that we are in a transition phase. We are in a process. We are in a process of change. You don't have everything in place from day one. When you move, home, you know, way, move away from home, from your parents, you don't move into a 12, well, most of us don't, move into a 12-room apartment. Maybe never, but anyway, to a big house or whatever. You know, you move into a one-room apartment, but you see a trajectory. You know, I will start to work at Telia, I will get richer, and then I will buy a four-room apartment. <laughs> So it's a trajectory, and this is the same thing here. We are in a tra trajectory of change, and that's the most important. And the Paris Agreement is so smart because it's built up exactly like that. It is built up because people have listened to people like you, to be honest. Why? Because they are saying that we need to upgrade national plans for climate action every five years. Why? Because the technological development is so rapid today. We cannot today even project what we can do five years from now. So why should we set targets based on today's technology when we probably five years from now can be much more ambitious? So that's how this agreement is built. So anyone who tells you that this Paris Agreement is you know, weak, always respond, no, it's a perfect agreement. It's just about implementation now. And we know that this is a challenge. These, how many know, have you seen this before? Oh my God, it's my, you know, it make me cry almost. This is not the case everywhere, you know, but I understand that you are a, a, you know, a very progressive company. The global goals, interesting enough, in the private sector, these have been really adopted in many ways. Uh, this is actually a unique set of goals. I've been working on sustainability issues since 1991. I started in the UN in 1996. And this is a transformative agenda. The fact that we could actually combine all these development targets with social targets, environmental targets, financial targets, economy, and also add the whole issue of partnership, the whole issue of safe or well-functioning institutions, peace and trade, etc., etc., is unique. Placing also the climate action agenda in a much broader context. And this is important today. And I will come back to that. Why is this so important today? because we have other changes happening right now. So the combination of the climate agreement 
and the SDGs was actually quite unique. And mind you, it was very smart because the SDGs came in September before Paris and addressed all these tricky things about the global financial system and so on. And then came the Paris Agreement. What about this? This is the most beautiful graph we have when you work, you know, when you work on climate action. Can you see what it is? Well, you know, these are the prices of, um, of energy. Price, they have translated into similar price. So fossil fuel, you have here. Extraordinary. Low price, quite stable price in comparison, uh, all the way back, you know, since the beginning of the century. Some increase here towards the end, which is actually quite good. They start to pay maybe the, the costs also. This is solar PV. And it starts when? It starts when we had the Copenhagen meeting. 2009. It starts. And it ends when we had the Paris meeting. 2015. That is the critical thing why you know, having these five-year programs is so important. So if we set the goals when the solar was up here, this is what we're going to achieve the next 30 years. How smart would that be? We had no clue about this development. And I, I promise you we didn't have a clue about how this would then also play out in reality. I can say, of course, behind this price dip, it's not just market, it's also a lot of politics. The fact that Germany had energy event and China was actually you know, very interested in, in pushing out uh, you know, solar technology and so on. But still, you had that price. And the effects of this then start to show off. Uh, International Energy Agency, I had to change the scales, that's why the curve is very flat down here, so it's difficult to see it. But International Energy Agency, they had this projection for solar in 2006. Looks quite depressing. You know, oh, it's going to be an increase, you know. So Greenpeace, they also made a calculation and checked, and they said, well, you know, we're going to get a a climate agreement in Copenhagen, and then it's really going to take off. It's going to be a transformative development. It's going to be, you know, exploding. And this is actually, you know, it's a huge difference here, of course. So it's going to, you know, really take off. International Energy Agency said, well, you know, maybe things will be a bit better. Okay. So, you know, we started to see that, you know, things were coming. So, okay. Greenpeace then felt, my, they are getting close. We better become more ambitious here. So they, they said, okay, no, it's going to go from basically zero to 100 gigawatt. This is gigawatt in just a few years, from you know, 2010 up to 2015, 100. And then, came, you know, then comes reality. Wow. It's beautiful, isn't it? These are the kind of you know, graphs that you recognize. Number of internet connection, number of mobile telephones, number... But, you know, in other sectors, this is actually quite cool. <laughs> yeah, 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 okay, we won't see that before. <laughs> so, and, and the explosion actually continues. I was in Morocco last week and visited one of the biggest solar plants they have. And because solar still is seen as, well, it's small scale, and you know what. This is a plant, 700 hectares. 700 hectares. 550 uh, megawatts, 2 million people. Connected. So we are moving now in a, in a direction where we will see a dramatic shift in the whole energy politics of the world. And actually many countries in the south, in Northern Africa and, and still in Middle East, well they've done it before, but in Northern Africa, they are saying, we're going to compete with the cheap energy provided in Northern Europe. We're going to attract new business to our region because we're going to be able to provide low-cost energy in the future. Transformative change. What is then driving this? Well, it's not too, any longer national politicians. And that's the other shift, why we could get the Paris Agreement. What is happening right now is that we see cities driving transformation. Cities saying that we do not want to get stuck in our development in the old fossil fuel economy. We are looking at the future. And you remember I told you, one million people per week is the growth of cities. So this is a perfect opportunity, combining the dramatic cut in energy prices from solar, wind and other renewables with a political drive to a new climate economy. The fact that this is seen as a competitive edge. And companies being in the front line there will see major opportunities from numbers such as this one. 
if you were from the f building industry, I can tell you, you would already be on the way out here. Because, you know, when they see numbers from McKinsey, of course, they're quite speculative, but that investments in infrastructure over the next 20 years is somewhere around 80 to 100 trillion, that's a thousand billion dollars. Is it a terrible number? But you can then see what it means. It means that in 20 years, we are supposed to build infrastructure where the value is more than the entire current stock today. You can be scared by this, but you can also see it as an enormous opportunity. If we can get these investments to be right, if we can get these investments to only add a very small additional, quite often capital cost in terms of investment, they can actually be the new climate economy. They can actually take us to a non-fossil society. And why this is so important and this combination of factors right now, why there is a reason to be so much more optimistic today than only five, six years ago, is that we now also see what can be seen as transformative shifts in politics in many countries. I had an opportunity to be on a program with the Indian environment minister a few years back, and he was saying then very clearly, we will never give up coal, environment minister, mind you, we will never give up coal, because coal is the cheapest source of energy we have. As long as this is the cheapest, we have a lot of poverty, we have to focus on development, we will not give up coal. This happened only two years later. Suddenly, solar started to hit on the coal price. And market then is perfect, because it will move towards the cheapest. And in this case, it was solar. And the fact is also that this is not just good for the climate, this is also a way of democratizing uh, the, the, the energy system. So it's easier to get this kind of energy out to the rural areas, to villages. And you can see a lot of positive examples where small businesses can start, in combination quite often with IT solutions. Connection through internet, telephone, etc. So there is a fantastic... Um, synergy between these two developments right now. And this also creates positive social impact. And I selected on purpose a case from the US in this case. They have a president who, who seems to um, forget certain numbers sometimes. So the US Department of Energy, they present every year reports on how, much, how many jobs are created in different energy sectors. So these are numbers from 2016, so a few years back. And uh, you can see then the number of people working in solar, in wind, and the increase. And the question is, okay, how many, how many are these actually? 374,000. Well, in the total fossil fuel sector in the US, coal, oil, etc., etc., about 100,000 people. So the fact that, yes, the transformation will cause certain businesses to lose out, but at the same time, it also creates a lot of new opportunities for companies that are... Uh, at the forefront. So the corporate sector will continue to lead very much of this transformation. Of course you will be there. I put you in the top left corner, you know. Maybe you should be in the top right. Big impact and, you know, what. But anyway, you're there. But what is also interesting is that many of these heavy sectors are really starting now to change as well. So the steel industry in Sweden, for instance, have said that they will be fossil, they are aiming to fossil-free steel by 2045. 2045, that's transformative change in the steel industry. <laughs> but all of them actually talk about the fact that they will need also then a lot of new solutions that you will provide. In, tr in transport sector, this is a clear, clear case. Um, what is interesting is that when they started this trip a few years back, they did add, you know, connect it to their climate ambitions. Yes, we have to do societal good. This is very important for the planet, etc. I spoke with them yesterday. They have a project called Hybrid, where they collaborate Vattenfall SSAB, standing for 10% of Swedish emissions, um, and, uh, and uh, LKAB. And when I talked to them yesterday, they said, this is not any longer a climate project for us. This is actually business development. Because they've seen these numbers, they've seen all these thousands of cities say we will be fossil free. They've seen all these investments that they count on, 20, you know, five to ten years from now, when they can offer this, we'll ask for steel that is fossil free. 
So we have to have this corporate leadership because the agenda ahead of, is, ahead of us is very tough. These are examples of how quickly we have to get CO2 emissions down. You remember the curve is still going up. We have to bend the curve, we have to get them down. And if we don't get them down quick enough, we have to also uh, reduce the CO2 in the atmosphere by negative uh, emissions, as it's called. It's very strange, but anyway, negative emissions. So sucking out carbon dioxide. We need corporate leadership because we also have to deal with global um, uh, security issues. And this is just one example. I will not dwell on it too much, but just to understand why things are so connected today. This is a very important region for the global economy. Okay? Uh, this shows the water availability in the region. It shows that today, this map is made by Coca-Cola, by the way, so it's absolutely true. Um, it shows that there is basically enough water for the economic activity of the region. So blue regions, blue areas here, okay, in terms of water availability. Red, very difficult, so in, uh, up in, in Beijing, for instance. They made just a calculation, how will the situation be in 2025 if we don't do anything? If we just look at projections in terms of water use uh, in cities, for industries, etc. What will happen in this region that is so important for economic stability and development? So just in five years. These are geopolitical changes that, will, that is driving China today to invest in land and water resources in Africa and Latin America to safeguard food security for the future. So we have geopolitical agendas moving forward. The fact that we need more biomass, bioenergy in Sweden cannot then be translated into a situation where we import this as palm oil from Southeast Asia. Today, about 90% of the biofuel used in Sweden is actually palm oil based. So, finishing up, a few just final concluding remarks. This is in Swedish. Um, it's actually headlines from last year showing that there is some anxiety in Sweden about mine, mines. The transformation will require a lot of new minerals, a lot of more minerals, as you also know, cobalt, vanadine, whatever. These are conflicts that will start to come up also in our part of the world. Sweden is rich on minerals. So the global uh, transformational agenda will, will cause new challenges that we have to deal with and where corporate sector also needs to take a lead. How can we focus on a circular economy? I know you have that as one of your key goals, the circular economy. So the daring goals that you are now presenting, I would argue, is really moving towards science-based targets. And science-based targets are quite often connected with different numbers set by the reality. The fact that we have to move from 405 ppm carbon dioxide and emissions to a situation where we actually can secure a 1.5 degree. We have to move from 50 billion uh, tons of carbon dioxide released every year to five. Why is this so important then that we have corporate sectors driving for this? Well, in Sweden we have the fossil free uh, initiative. All these sectors have set science based targets as sectors. They have argued, they have said that they will all strive towards fossil free operations by 2045. This is fantastic. I don't see the telecom sector yet. But you are an enabler, and that is actually critical. If you look at many of these uh, strategies that they put together, they are talking very much about the enabling environment that they need. And they need the technologies, etc. So these will drive a lot the business development over the next decade and two. And finally, this terrible graph, I just wanted to end there, because this is both positive but at the same time also a bit scary. And you haven't seen this one, by the way, because it's actually from a report that will be released next week by Thomson and Reuters. But they gave me permission to use it. This shows the 25 biggest emitters in the world today. Telia is not there. <laughs> Do you feel happy? Of course not. We are not one of the big emitters. But there are 25 biggest emitters. Coal India up there. How many have heard about Coal India? four or five, they emit 4% of global CO2 emissions. 4%, 10 times more than Sweden. Um, they have 550,000 employees also. 
so these 25 companies, they represent 20% of all emissions in the world. So you only need to gather these 25 CEOs and tell them to do something, and we will actually come a long way. So what this report is looking at is actually how many of them have set some kind of science-based targets. Because what, what they will argue is that if we don't set these targets, very clear targets saying we are moving to fossil-free society by 2030, 2045, we will not succeed. And if we are looking at the biggest 25 emitters, they are far from setting science-based targets. So these are, you could say, level of ambition. You, the more they have here, the better it is. So level of ambition. So only three companies here are moving to publicly committed science-based targets. So we still need corporate leadership. We need examples of corporations that dare to set goals that actually go beyond what feels comfortable today. And I would argue that you are in the best position for this. I have high expectations because you are in a sector that is very used to transformative change and to set, I think, daring goals for the future. So thank you very much.